go. Who who starts then? Who starts? This is coming out on both of our podcasts. Good to see you, Tommy. It's um, we were just talking. It's been what fourteen, fifteen months since we we had a decent sit down and a chat. I know it's crazy, man. I know we were just we were just talking about that. I think, um, like I said, I had a hell of a lot more hair. Um, so uh, I'm going the opposite way. <laughs> mm, yeah, and I think um, like we, we kick things off because it had been a while since our chat. Pre, prior to that as well, like I think it had been six months or a year. Yeah. It never feels like that long um, when we connect and we talk, but I think like we had a, we had a baby, you had a book. You and I did. We did have a baby. Yeah, we did. It? We did. It was a, it was an interesting looking one. <laughs> it was. It was. I don't know how we managed it, man. We're biologically uh, very, very unprepared, but we got there. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, and you had a you had a book that had just come out as well. Yes, that's right. Yes, it. Uh, what was that? That was uh, well. I think it had officially come out a couple of months prior to that. But um, yeah, so had a so had the baby. Very true. Very true. <laughs> that, 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 the book actually came out with the baby. So yeah, the baby's <laughs> holding the book. <laughs> yeah, I was actually reading it. Yeah, he's uh, he's a smart baby. He maybe is. <laughs> <laughs> take um, his old man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, might take after his mother actually. Sure. Um, mate, so you're in the midst of writing another book, aren't you? I'm in the midst of writing three. Three. Um, All right. Yeah. So good. Good. Trying not to. Uh, I didn't. I didn't mean to, but um, I'm. I'm pretty close. I'm about. Uh, I'd say two weeks off finishing the third draft of my second, which is just a huge um, backbreaker because th- this draft has just taken me coming up to a year, I think. Um, mm. I, do you know what? I actually think I, I, had, I think I was writing this draft where I'd just begun writing this draft um, when we'd done our previous podcast. So it's longer than a year. <laughs> so yeah. this is a big one. Shit, yeah, mate. Yeah. So what's this, what's this one all about? Yeah. Well, it's, um, I tried to, uh, go into the deepest possible roots I could of identity uh, because mm. it's, you know, it's so malleable. And you know, my first book was called, yes, I'm fine. Just tired. Uh, this one's called, yes, I'm fine. Just busy. Um, you know, the idea being there that the busier we are, the, um, you know, the less we can really see the truth. And then the next question is, what is the truth? Um, and the third book I'm writing. So the, the, the third and the one I'm writing now is, um, were, were conjoined, you know, were kind of juxtaposed because, you know, the third one really, really just rode the wave of the, the, the second one I'm talking about now. But I made it a third one because it was just too big. Mm. So that one's actually going to be called, yes, I'm fine, just thinking. So it's a really fun way to have those, I suppose. And is that the one that you just kind of, unpa- where you unpack the truth <laughs> and give us all, all, of, the, all of the answers? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a bit different again, I suppose. So the one I'm writing now is about identity and how it's malleable and how we can actually um, analyze and see that across multiple levels of analysis. So we have a look at what identity is from the evolutionary perspective, uh, from a more spiritual, perhaps, I suppose, um, and then also kind of a psychoanalytic perspective. The third book, Yes, I'm Fine, Just Thinking, is actually how to integrate awareness because this is something that has consistently come up for me in my counseling sessions, you know, oftentimes we think that going to speak to a therapist or, or, or perhaps, um, you know, journaling or meditating, you know, all these great tools that, that, um, that cultivate self-awareness, um, that they're actually leading to change, um, in and of themselves. And they are to a degree, but I really wanted to make the necessary, I felt distinction between what awareness is and then what, what integration is. So it's all well and good for, you know, for someone to speak to a counselor or speak to a therapist, Mm. but how do we actually take that and then apply that to our lives? So I suppose what I wanted to do in this book was, was, was talk about all the things I was writing about really help people unpack layers of awareness and then how they could actually integrate that and, and make those, those changes. So I thought it would be a good book um, by itself. That's why I kind of switched it around. Mm. Awesome, man. And I mean, yeah, awareness like the the more I think about it and kind of the probably the the more aware I become of yeah. of myself like I, I realize it's just the first step 
basically. Like you can, as you said, you can go to a counselor or to use a, use another analogy. Um, you can come and see me as a physiotherapist Absolutely. with an injury and yeah. I can point out to you what's wrong and I can tell you the stuff that you need to go away and do. Yes. But if you don't do it, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, you're, uh, you'll probably get better because time is a great healer, but <laughs> you lose a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. 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 You'll limp around for a while anyway. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's, if, that's a much more tangible example as well. It's just that. Uh, and it's funny, I, I don't even know, um, I, I, and you know, my own experience, I always thought that speaking to a psychologist was, was doing the work, you know, and mm. that was actually just the painful stuff. This is essentially why you're fucked. And now here's what to do about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, 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 that's probably something that, um, you might get into in the current book that you're writing as well is that like going and talking to people feels like it's the work, but it's actually just, it's just kind of busyness Mm. or it's the part before the work that you need to put in. It's so true. It's so true. And you know, I I also don't want to kind of disregard or, you know, valid, you know, invalidate people's experience when they're going to speak to someone. Cause like you said, man, it, it is challenging. And, Mm. To, to actually take that first step and, and, and say to yourself effectively, oh, I'm, I actually don't have all the answers here. I, I need someone to help me is, is, is doing something, which, which is yeah. massive, you know, but it's not doing everything. And I think that's such an important uh, position to take so that we don't feel like job's done, you know, and you and I both obviously agree with this, that the job's never done. You can't press mm. pause on life and, until you obviously pass away. So, um, I think just, just knowing those things and, and, you know, I, I tried to have a bit of fun with the book as well. Um, you know, talking about dream analysis and, you know, doing all the things that I'm into as well. So yeah, yeah it's, it's not, it's not just, um, hopefully it's not boring. <laughs> and a bit of classic Tom Ahern humor as well. I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a bit of that in there. Yeah. A couple of yeah. gags. <laughs> yeah. I thought there'd be a couple of dick jokes in there. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, like, really fascinated. Like you've been thinking a lot about kind of identity and, and how it's malleable. Like wh- what's changed in your view of your own identity maybe over the last 18 months since you've been jumping into this? Yeah. Well, I, I didn't, you know, the, the reason I write my books isn't necessarily, you know, to be known as an author or anything. It's because I'm just, I, I really want to find out these answers for myself. So that mm. I suppose they really come from a very selfish perspective initially, but I started writing this book because I'd lost my own identity. You know, I, I didn't know who I was and it was really scary. I was drowning um, in the waters of the unconscious because um, I had nothing to cling on to. There was no ego um, you know, sailing a, a ship or anything. I had no direction. Um, and, and that kind of happened um, when I stopped playing football, um, had found CrossFit, but it felt kind of like the shell of who I was with football. I felt so linked to football. Um, and then when I hurt my knee moving overseas, um, and I realized that athletes and Tom were no longer, um, you know, linked, I really because I, I just wanted to be an athlete my whole life, you know? Mm. And then when my knee injury kind of got the better of me, I, I really started to have to think about, well, you know, it's probably as impossible, at least in the foreseeable future. And I also want to go traveling and I fell in love at the same time and, you know, all these sorts of things. So that wasn't, I say it now, you know, and it sounds so, so simple, but it was very scary for a good couple of years there because I just didn't know who I was. I thought, I thought athlete was me, you know? So I suppose the, the, the reason why I wanted to study this kind of stuff, which really is depth psychology, you know, getting to the root of who someone is, um, was very important to me because I felt like I was, I was drowning, um, you know, and it's different when, you know, some of the stuff I talk about in the book is, you know, the difference between like consciously deciding to take something on that is never inevitably going to change your identity. Like, you know, I can only guess that for you, for example, do like becoming a father, obviously it's a massive decision. It's going to change your identity. There's going to be like a pre um, child and a post child experience in life, but you're also looking forward to it. 
not just counting how bloody challenging it would be, but you were almost, you had that like, I'm ready to make this step, I suppose. I don't know. Do you, did you feel that? Yeah, probably, probably yes and no. And, and yeah. actually I think I felt like a lot of other guys out there um, who are like, yeah, I can probably be a dad, yeah. but I'm not, I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think like as, as males, we probably lack the same biological driver or as females who sure. say, yeah, I'm ready to be a mum. Yeah. Um, and there's that, that biological sort of stuff that's going on for them. But like everyone that I talked to about it was like, you're, you're never ready. Mm. Like you never, you're never ready before they arrive. And then they're here and yeah. you just have to do it. Um, but, uh, but I think as well, like, as you said, it, it massively, it, it changes your identity as well. And it changes your perspective. And like, in essence, I'm still, I'm still the same person that I was before Connor arrived. Um, but I think like it, it's changed my perspective on a lot of things. It's changed my priorities on a lot of things. Um, and I don't know if this is kind of just natural evolution for me as well. Um, or if it's, if it's accelerated it, but it's, mm. I think it's probably accelerated, but it's made me much more, aware and in touch of my emotions and what's driving them too. Mm. What do you mean by that? Like how does it change your emotion? So like, I mean, I'm a, we're typical Kiwi and Aussie guys. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> no, 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 slightly, slightly stoic, not probably weren't particularly in touch with our emotions when we were younger. <laughs> um, I think it's probably just heightened them a little bit. Um, like, You'd you'd kind of see see something touching on the internet. You're like, oh, not in a creepy way, but yeah. in like a like a heartfelt touching sort of video before uh, before you you become a dad. And you're like, oh, it's, yes. it's nice, that's nice. That. <laughs> but um, yeah, then then afterwards you're like, oh shit, that's that's kind of bringing a tear to my eye. Um, and like today as well is like I, I was sitting down, I was having a meeting at work and like here in New Zealand, we've, we've basically just come out of lockdown and we're starting to get yeah. back into things. So we, we had to kind of take all of our services and deliver them virtually and work virtually as a team when we'd previously been in the same office space. And like my guys, my team came together ridiculously well. And I was just, I was talking to them about stuff today and I just said look I'm, I'm just so proud of you guys for how you came together and the work that you put in how we supported each other through this period of time and I started to get a bit choked up about it yeah and I was just like I think it's just kind of experiencing experiencing emotions on a on a slightly more heightened level mm. I think and um, I don't know maybe just feeling them a little bit more deeply just kind of cracks you open a bit yeah, it does. It does. And I think you give less of a fuck about showing them to people as well as like, actually, what am I holding? What am I holding this stuff back for? Mm. Like this, there's this tiny little baby that blows your mind with doing new stuff every day and is just, yeah. Like it's a, it's a miracle of life, the miracle of life. But, um, all of a sudden you're like, well, actually who cares if I have a bit of a cry in front of people? It doesn't matter. Man, I, I don't, oh, my, my, my other half and I were, were, were trying to think this through where like, where did, when, when did this whole idea that emotions, uh, are weak or, or whatever it is, where did that come from? Like I, I tried to backtrack it to perhaps like the first bill, the first world war where, you know, blokes were getting um, either honorable or dishonorable, you know, discharges and things because I suppose like psychological injuries, you know, weren't really something that you could see. But mm. what, what's so interesting to me is like how we put these labels on what's weak and what's not. But, you know, when you, when you learn a bit more about trauma therapy as an example, seeing what the body necessarily has to do to, to 
to, to allow the, the hormones and, and all that sort of stuff to move through the body so they can, they can actually get back. Now we have this ability to decide how we want to act. You know, when, when we let out, when we suppress our emotions because it's for whatever reason, some kind of labels being put on them, it can literally take years off our lives. And I don't know where, I just don't know where that came from, where like how emotions are, are weak because we, we've had them for long, mm. far longer than 200 million years. It's so strange to me. I don't know. Yeah. Where did you, like, where did you get back to and looking at that stuff? Well, yeah, I mean, I got, I got as far back as 210 million years with the development mm. of, of the mammalian. Quite brain, a while. Really. Yeah. So yeah. You know, what, ballpark figure. Yeah, <laughs> I got I got got a while there, but even to go even further back with um you know something that um Jordan Peterson talks about with um lobsters being three hundred and fifty million years old, this this nervous system, you know, structure, um, the ability for us to be aware of where we stand in, in social hierarchies and things, it's so old, and yet we're only now just starting to have a conversation around you know it's okay not be okay and, and mm. uncomfortable is okay you know um the words of the great man by yourself but I, it's i i really don't know i really don't know <laughs> yeah like it, it's fascinating you look at some of the kind of the, the older societies that we have and and like i'm just spitballing here i haven't looked at them nearly yeah, as closely yeah. as you um but like take for example stoicism Mm-hmm. as well stoicism uh, and, and being stoic gets quite a bad rap at the moment and because i think because people don't really understand it mm. it's uh, rather than kind of repressing your emotions the stoics looked at them more deeply and tried to understand them and then kind of made decisions based off off that through the perspective that they took on them mm. as opposed to having an emotion repressing it and just getting on with shit. Yeah, exactly. And you're exactly right. And to think that, I think we've done a brilliant job in the last 500 years of overvaluing one part of the brain that happens to be the youngest part of the brain. You know, Mm. we're very cognitive, we're very objective, you know, but, but most of all actually of what's driven us to the 21st century is how to act. Emotions, it's, it's, fulfillment it's getting to a pleasure you know a pleasurable place from a painful place it's these emotions that are driving our behavior even the word emotion is energy in motion it's what are we Mm. doing as opposed to you know and this is obviously getting into the the field of morality that you can't derive an ought from an is we don't we, we just don't look at the world as a place of things you know we look at our place in the world and, and how we should do and all the world's a stage. And, you know, we, we've, um, we've just become very good at neglecting some of what I would describe as the very ancient wisdom that's, that's inherent in the body. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting kind of where we like thinking, looking back where we lost our way mm. on that. Um, what like did you did you look at the industrial revolution much in terms of kind of what what was happening around that time too? Yeah, uh, I think it. Uh, I, well, I mean, I think it came from as early as Descartes. You know. Yeah. I, I really think that's when it came. And don't get me wrong, I think the objective worldview is very. We wouldn't be having. We wouldn't be friends without no. science. We've no, not at all. Met. Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. like one of my best mates, <laughs> podcasting mates. It's, it's, it's strange. Uh, it's strange kind of who you, who I know virtually, right? <sighs> that I've never met in person, exactly. but can sit down and have a yarn like this. Yeah, exactly. It would probably be like the most awkward thing in real life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, hey, uh, do we shake hands or is that <laughs> yeah. inappropriate now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. No, so I, I think maybe just, um, looking back into how we got to where we are today, not throwing out all the baby with the bathwater, the scientific perspective has been great, but now we're all lost and existential and, you know, nihilistic. And I think, and these aren't my ideas. This is just some ideas that I took from other people that work from my own experience, but looking back to what got us here with, you know, the subjectivity and if we can mold those two now, 
which I think is what the world's doing, I suppose. I think everyone's starting to think about, you know, being a bit more honest and, you know, understanding themselves, being okay with who they are and, you know, asking questions and, well, I hope so anyway. I'm biased because mm. I see that all the time, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's, that, that's something that I definitely see more of as well because you're 26, eh, hey, Tom? 27. 27. Sorry, mate. Sorry. Come on, mate. <laughs> Come on. Wise, quite, wiser, than, wiser than I thought. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like, I'm, I'm what, nine years, nine years older than you. So I think I, I probably had a, had a chance to see that, that evolution a little bit mm. more, but I think again, you're, you're right in that because of the stuff that we do and because of the way that we think we move in certain circles and the mm. circles that we move in probably are the ones that we see this, this, this stuff happening more often. And I mean, the Facebook algorithm will feed us that, that shit as well. So yeah. like, I think, I, I think there's definitely more of it happening. Um, whether it's kind of as much as, as we think it is or not. Um, I don't know. I don't get millions of downloads on my podcasts. <laughs> so maybe, maybe it's not that many people. <laughs> <laughs> just, just you and myself. Mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And mum and mum. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That. That. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. And how do you, I mean, do you see that kind of playing out? Because when I think of physiotherapy as well, I, cause I'm so biased. I can't help but, but think about the psychosomatic perspective on, on body injuries as well mm. and all that sort of stuff. I mean, how much of your role is counselor as well? I've, I've been having a few conversations like this recently, actually. Yeah. And I think like when you, when you start out, um, in, in any sort of health profession, it is very much, uh, I'm going to go off all of the theory that I've just learned. It's definitely biomechanical yeah. um, or it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's a, the, a problem with this system. Um, but like I've been a physio now for, I don't know, 13 or 14 years. Yeah. Um, and I work a lot with people who have uh, chronic pain or complex injury. Um, and I think like it's probably 20 to 25 percent is the actual injury itself yeah. like i said that stuff mostly gets better with time um and 80 percent of it is the psychological stuff and like so i kind of i kind of think about it like how can i how can i make this person help this person be more resilient to mm. navigate the challenge that they're in at the moment if i give them if I give them the right exercises to do, then they're going to get better. And the right exercises aren't ones that are particularly complex. Yeah. Like every now and then you get something cool come in and you're like, Oh, I'm going to have to think hard on this one. Yeah. Um, but it's, it is more of kind of managing expectations and creating some safety for people, uh, creating a sense of hope that they can work, work towards, but then also kind of, progressively managing their expectations as they work through a process as well, because you can't go too fast because then actually things get stirred up and people don't feel safe and they kind of start to withdraw. Um, but you don't want to go too slowly either because then that just kind of enhances people's fear if you're holding them back. So it's a, mm. it's an interesting balancing act. And I think like the vast majority of it is like, how do I manage the the kind of the, the mindset or the psychology of this person as opposed to how do I purely manage this injury? I'm yeah. biased though. I'm very biased. You talk yeah. to other physios and they'll be like 90%. It's the injury. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's so hard to kind of take ourselves out of our own perspectives, but um, dude, I agree with you. And you know, I think what you're talking about there is so congruent with the ideas of Chikset Mahai. So he, he wrote, you know, about flow, that idea mm. that to really find your flow when time adapts to your experience, um, it's a brilliant quote, uh, you know, that idea that we want to see progress, you know, what we're doing isn't overly challenging. So it's not anxiety provoking, but it's also not boring you know, that idea mm. that we can, and then even further to abstract out of that, it's that idea that we are moving from 
a painful place to a better future. We're always in that state, which is which is so interesting because it's like we and, and you know to my point before, we've been getting very good at understanding the objective world. This is a candle. This is a computer. That is Saturn. That is Mars. And we've we've really lost that. Well, how do we live in this world? You know, what's the subjectivity? What better future am I moving to? Why is it necessary for me to overcome this injury? Who am I? Who do I want to be? So I suppose um, it's probably why you and I connect, mate, you know, Mm. irrespective of the industry, there is that idea based upon your psychology and my psychology of how do we integrate this kind of experience into our lives and into our clients' lives. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's fascinating. And like, I've been, I've been running a few workshops and doing a little bit of coaching with people at the moment, kind of out, outside of the physio stuff, um, around kind of low load management. So it's, it's the, how am I managing the loads in my life at the moment? Like, like, pro- uh, like having physical rehab principles, mm-hmm. but applying that kind of across the spectrum and using the psychology of that. And I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, the Yerx Dodson curve or the Yerx Dodson law. No. So it's um it's performance versus arousal level. Oh yes. Yeah yeah. So it's, it's the you, you start off like yeah yeah you start off low and then you hit peak right. and then you come back down and I think like most people that I have talked to um and obviously like I I move in health circles so I've I've done this with a lot of health professionals who have been basically working throughout but they're kind of sliding down that um that side of the curve towards overwhelm just Mm. because there's so much load going on them at the moment um i've run a few others with actually some crossfit gyms and uh some of the some of the members there haven't had that much to do over this period of time. So they're sitting on the other side, they're sitting down in that, like that comfort zone. And I kind of break, break that curve up actually into, into three different facets as you've got the comfort zone on that lower end of the load. And then you've got your performance zone or your stretch zone in your middle. And then that sort of zone of overwhelm as well. And it's, it's, it's kind of like when you're starting to head down into the wards, that overwhelm zone, that's, that's almost like you've got an injury. So it's like, how do I come back up out of that? And how do I get back to that peak performance? Because I've overloaded myself and, and injured myself for a one of, one of a better word. A lot of people I, f- I find can do that just with a little bit of, of load manipulation in the time and can kind of swing back towards peak performance. And it's like, I don't think it's, it's probably, there's more work that people need to do after that but it's really interesting kind of how you can manipulate the loading on someone Mm. just by changing a few small things to take the pressure off so that they can start to slide back and they can create a little bit more space then to maybe do some more of that long-term work yeah Uh, i mean i think what you just said there goes for every industry you know i really Mm. think we all want to feel like the work we're doing is challenging and therefore uh, meaningful, but it's also, you know, not chaotic and, you know, we are on top of it. Like it's, it's so Mm. hard. And, you know, I think about balance, right? This idea that we should have a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of this and such a, there's such a static way to look at life. Everyone's trying to, find their balance you know to, to, which is essentially the same way of saying trying to get to this place where you know everything is good so it's like mm. I'm, I'm doing all the right things but you, i mean we're future oriented you know you can't you can't get out of that inevitable truth we're always moving from point a to point b up until we die and i think balance is very much congruent with what you said about the you and about what uh, to accept Mahaya talks about with flow balance is that ability to mediate tasks that are too challenging and not challenging enough so that we're simultaneous. So we're seeing progress and, uh, and, and we feel like we're on top of things, you know? Mm. And I think that's, uh, that's something that you constantly need to tweak as well as that. And balance, I think is balance to me is sounds like a static concept that people are searching for is like, Mm. all right, if I do this and this and this and this, 
then I'm in balance oh, and good. then it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's really regimented. And then if you don't yeah. do that, then you get pissed off at yourself and, and wind yourself up. But I think that like our, we're, we're pretty fluid beings as humans as well. And our, what is in balance for us, what might be in balance for us one day, the next day, is not going to be in balance Mm. because we haven't had a great sleep because our two-year-old's woken up three times overnight or, uh, or you've got a, got a cold or a flu or something like that. Or I don't know. Dogs. The dogs crapped on the carpet or something, something like that. And and I crapped on the carpet. (laughs) Yeah. And then the dog ate it and then threw it up. And then I ate it and threw it up. (laughs) Yeah. And then you know, your partner started yelling at you for all of that. Yeah. And yeah. then obviously liked at the same time, couldn't save money and you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But okay. yeah, that, that that balance of stuff changes depending on on our environment and it's it can be kind of it's a moving target, I guess. Yeah. It's always a moving target, isn't it? Yeah. And even even just your own laziness and um, procrastination. Like I'm I'm God, I'm like that all the time at the moment. Like, oh, I'm like, oh, I'll set my alarm for seven. I wake up, it's like 8.30. <laughs> I'm like, oh, right. Well, that just throws the schedule out. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I'll wake up at 4.30 or 5. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, then that throws the schedule out too, but I have to readjust. And I don't know. It's, it's just this funny, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just as bad as the next guy for giving out advice you know, that I think is really helpful. And what I'm saying here is I'm, I'm, I'm just a biggest part of the problem since that we live, live now in this world where we can access information all the time and the information is marketed as such that it's the, the only thing you need to know and that'll mm. fix your life, you know. But it's, it's, it's just impossible, A, because, you know, we, we know our own lives better than anyone and B, you're never going to have the same day. So that, that piece of advice might work perfectly for me today. Then tomorrow, it's just like, oh, well, what I read 10 years ago in a psychology book is actually what applies to me now. You know, yeah. I'm just finding this constant, it's a, very, it's a very funny world we live in in this kind of self-development boom, you know? Yeah, and I think like, the, the more that I start, that I ask, questions um and kind of the more that i live life the the more that i realize that there isn't just one right answer Mm. for things and i I think like it's a cliche but the the toolbox analogy is is fantastic Mm. is that you have a you have a range of tools at your disposal um i think someone you referred to it as an a la carte menu the other day is that you've got these options there that you can pick and choose from and, and and use on a certain day. And what works for you some days isn't going to work for you other days. Like, um, I'm sure that you do a little bit of, of meditation. I haven't from, used from, it, mate, so it's from, probably get- <laughs> <laughs> from, from time to time. But like some days, if you're, if you're meditating, like some days you're like, sweet, yeah. down into it, golden. Mm. Other days you're like, I just can't sit here and do this. I need to go out for a run. Yes. And and utilizing those tools to to have a similar effect mm. I think is is really important and yeah and then I think it comes back to that concept of awareness of of yourself as well as is what's the awareness that I have of what's going on for me at the moment um and then what tools do I have at my disposal that I can then use to action. It's so true. Yeah. You know, everything can be a tool, you know, even Mm. I I found that even putting the, putting the the fire on, you know, like the wood and just looking at the wood is really lovely or playing with the dogs. And I think you're you're totally right, man. You can't be a master of the tool unless you've you've tried it, you've given it a go. And I think there are moments where, you know, we'll, we'll just be staring at our computer screens for hours. You're know, like, I think I need some connection. And then you go and talk yeah. to your spouse or you call your parents or whatever you need to do. So that, I mean, that's a brilliant tool, you know. Mm. And um, I think the idea behind tool as well, which I think is a really important one, is that the analogy of tool only works if you're building a house. 
So everything that you're doing has to be for a particular reason. You know, and I heard Alan Watts talking about this on a lecture mm -hmm. whenever it was recorded 40, 50 years ago. And um, he said, you know, people are always asking me, is it necessary? Is it necessary to meditate? Is it necessary to do all these things? And he said, well, it depends on what you're doing. Like, where do you want to go? His analogy was, is it, if you're, if you're driving to New York, it's necessary to take the highway. So what are you doing in your life that actually renders meditation worthwhile and necessary mm. because, you know, I mean, and that, and that depends on the, on the frequency and the intensity as well. You know, if you want to be a monk, you're probably going to have to meditate a hell of a lot more than, than you and I, if you are, if you and I are just trying to, you know, um, turn the dial on the, on the, on the, chill uh, the fuck out. out. <laughs> chill the fuck out. Probably a better way of saying it. Yeah. <laughs> if, that's, if that's what we're trying to do, then maybe 15 minutes will, will mm. work for us, you know? I mean, everything comes down to ultimately what you're doing. You know, what is your point B? And, you know, on a slight tangent, I'm finding that to be the biggest thing coming up. Second to relationships in the counseling world is that people don't have a point B. They don't have an aim. You know, they're, they're just uncertain. Mm. And, and people use a whole different array of words for this. Suicidal depressed, uh, anxious, lost, angry, you know, and, and however many times it's just, and, and not for everyone, people have their own, you know, separate issues and things, but I'd say over 60, 70%, it's, I don't have a point P, I don't have a reason to be getting out of bed or, or they, or they, they, they do, but they're just perhaps not uh, consciously aware of, of what they're doing. So I think I've become very interested in that point B idea. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really important one um, for for people and like when you're, I'm I'm sure that you find as well that you get better results with people who have a point B. Well, there's a there's a reason. Yeah, yeah. that that makes the them more yeah that makes them more resilient. That makes them kind of want to get better. And and I think like from a physical perspective, you ask people like what do you want to get back to? Like, yeah. do you play any sport or do you go, do you go running or what's your work? And the, the it's all, you, your heart always sinks a little bit when they say, Oh no, nothing. I know. Like, oh, what are we doing then? <laughs> how am I going to, yeah. How am I going to take you through this, this process? Um, yeah. it, it, it's going to be a, it'll be an interesting one. And I think like you can, it's easy to take, well, no, not easy. It's, you can take people part of the way through that process because you're taking them away from pain, but you can't take people through that whole process because like, if you think of it kind of from a, a pain to pleasure continuum, like when people get far enough away from pain, they don't notice it anymore, really? but then they stop and they're only halfway there. Brilliant. Point. Whereas if you can, if you can kind of generate, maybe, I, I don't know if I like the word pleasure because mm -hmm. it's, it sounds kind of in the moment, maybe pain to purpose yeah. as a continuum. It's a, again, kind of cliched word, but you can, you take people away from the pain far enough and then they just kind of sit there. And if they're not moving towards purpose, then like for, for you, probably not so much in a physical sense is that they start to slide back mm. towards pain because they're not continuing to move that way. Yeah, dude, I, God, I, I resonate so, so much with, with what you just said. Um, and I think, I think, you know, one of the tough challenges about psychology is that, you know, I, I, I'm big on journaling because mm. Pain and, and pleasure, or pain and purpose. That she sets a tongue for stuff. Pain and purpose. <laughs> um, they're, they're very, um, they're very intangible. You know, people come to you mm. and they say, "Oh, I'm depressed." You know, um, or I'm lost. It's like, okay, well, what does that look like? But when you go to a physio, it's like, oh, I can't extend my knee, or, or yeah, like that. it's like, I, I can measure that shit. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, one of the things I try to do is is is, is measure people's pain from a psychological perspective, mm. based upon um, comparing them with with where they'd like to be, or perhaps who they used to be when they were fulfilled. You know, and we just journal. We just like 
what's a typical day in your life like? And it can be very confronting to people because, you know, when we go back and read that, it's filled with things that uh, are tough for them to read. Oh, I'm addicted to porn or alcohol or, you know, I always sleep in or, I'm, you know, I lie a lot or all these things. And when you really see that, it's just like, oh, damn, like no wonder I'm in pain, you know, it's very mm. easy to kind of avoid that truth. But I think your point about getting like 50% away from the pain and then recoiling back into that is so true, even in my area, because we don't feel pain psychologically anymore. We can just numb it all mm. the fucking time, all the fucking time. And that inability to feel pain as one of the two most fundamental uh, motivators for human behavior, if you just take one of them away, no wonder, and no wonder everyone's fucking depressed and existential because we don't, we don't have a major framework. It's gone, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, one of my, one of my previous podcast guests as well, kind of used, used something or said something that, reminds me of that is that the body always whispers before it screams. But I think, as you say, we're so guilty of numbing that, that small pain that starts to whisper to us, say, Hey, you probably want to check this out. Like something's a bit off here. Like (laughs) you want to, you want to have a look at that, but then you numb it with something. You're like, nah, no, I'll go and yeah, watch some porn and <laughs> drink a slab or something like that. Um, That's a great two minutes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then I feel all right again. Um, <laughs> but and then all of a sudden, because you can numb it, you hit a tipping point where all of a sudden that pain becomes too much, and then you can't numb it with things anymore. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's just. Um it's, it's, it's crazy that, that, that idea. Um, you, you know, I, I, I was walking Archie, one of our dogs and, uh, he was, he's just in that face. He's just so young and he's just in that face where everything's novel and new and he can't stop running and he pulls on the leash all the time. And normally I would um, listen to a podcast whilst walking him and, you know, I, I'll discipline him and I'll train him and I'll get him to sit and all this stuff, but it's quite tolerable because I'm interested in what I'm listening to. But, uh, a couple of days ago, it was yesterday actually, um, I just didn't have my, 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 my phone because my partner and I had planned to, to walk together. Um, you know, halfway through the walk, we were like, okay, this isn't going to work. They're just shocking when you walk them both together. <laughs> so I walked him home and dude, I hated it by the end of it. Mm. Like I was literally fantasizing about punching him, beating him up because I was so angry, so angry and frustrated. And, and I just had to sit down and I just had, I was just like, wow, this is a, a pain and an anger that, that I've just been completely unconscious of because I've been tuning out and listening to my podcast. Now, what was interesting for me was like, okay, the podcast has actually served as a relatively practical distraction mm. because I can still do my job with the dog and not actually want to beat him to a pulp because I actually quite love him. <laughs> but it was so interesting for me to actually really feel that because I didn't have a choice. Yeah. Yeah. That is fascinating as well. Um, like looking back on that, have you been able to kind of f- like figure out what was behind it or flip your perspective on it at all? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I have, I, I was just, um, you know, Oh, he's one of them now. Um, I think I'm naturally a selfish person and yeah. I, I really struggle, um, when I, I can't at least get something out of something that I'm doing, which mm. is a very um, uh, humbling thing to say, I suppose, because I don't particularly like that about myself. And it's a skill I'm trying to develop yeah. more selfless, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, I think changing that perspective and being like, okay, this is Archie's time. You know, it's not my time. Yeah. Can I, can I posit something to you though, Tom, hey, like please. that you, maybe you could get out of this. So I, re, I recently finished reading awareness by Anthony DeMello. Oh, wow. Um, I don't know if you've come across that, but it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. And, and one of the things that he was talking about in there is just kind of our ability to name things is fantastic but it's also detrimental to us because we stop looking at the uniqueness 
in life. Like you call something a tree and you're like, you have this mental picture of it that comes up, but actually this tree is not that tree and it's not that tree. So could you, could you work on the walks, look at seeing the world a little bit like Archie and, or as I do like Connor, who's two, who, who is also into this stuff yes. and seeing the uniqueness of, of every different thing. So that's something that I've, that I've been trying to work on a little bit over the last couple of weeks. And you get, you're like, shit, the way that the light is hitting that tree today is really, really cool. Or the birds that are flying around in it. And actually they're the, they're the same bird or they're the same species of bird, but they look quite different. If once you start to look at them as individual things and it just, I, like I always find it creates a little bit more a sense of wonder about the world. Um, and like to go back to that tool analogy as well, mm. like it's a tool to use, but also to extend the metaphor further, when you start using a tool, you're pretty shit at it. Like the nails that you hammer in, they like, I get halfway in and then they'll bend over and you're like, oh. Double so <laughs> you need to, yeah, you're like, oh, yeah, That's fixed good. it. That'll hold. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's, yeah, you, need to, you need to keep practicing that tool as well So you, uh, with that tool so you do get good at it. So it's like some days I have an absolute shocker when I try and do that stuff. I'm just like, oh. No, and other days I would come back from the walk, and it's and it's just like, oh, that was that was epic. I live in an amazing piece of the world. Oh, dude, you're so right. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the skill I need to. Yeah, you're right. We when we get older, we work, we we sacrifice novelty for routine and habit. Um, mm. You know, that's something that I love watching the dogs. You know, kind of discern. You know, because their world is just, they live in this fucking crazy psychedelic trip right now. Everything yeah. is crazy and novel. And that's, <laughs> is that because you feed them stuff? That is true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> of the psychedelic variety. <laughs> but um, no, like they're in that universe. And um, that's obviously why they're, you know, simultaneously so dependent because they can't make sense of anything. And he just runs across the road and everything's crazy and wonderful. And, you know, and I, I thought about this for a while, man. I think, um, you know, self-development and individuality is so much about coming back to that childlike sense of wonder mm. that we lose necessarily as we start to socialize and, 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 and learn things that we can, you know, eventually habitualize to. And, um, <clears throat> I think it's, it's an inevitable stage of human development going back and reclaiming the child that was, uh, that was lost when we started to learn about what a tree was and things like that. But, um, you're totally right, man. I think walking, walking the big fella, Mr. Grandpa Jones over there with the big chops. I think you're right. I think you're totally right. Yeah. And I think like, it's an important thing to be able to not to have to tax our mental processing. So, so much by, recognizing that everything's different um, so that we just don't get super overloaded. But I think we, we probably go too far the other way mm -hmm. and then actually it's, it's a good skill to, to retrain and, and to look at kind of where can I get a little bit of wonder back in my life. Have you, have you noticed that with, with having Connor, like what's that yeah. like seeing? Yeah. Talk to me. Fatherhood, man. It would be incredible. It's some, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. Like he's at the age now where he, he's doing something new every day or every second day. And you're just like, Holy, Holy crap. This yeah. is, this is amazing. And like, I, I've, I've talked to my wife about it, that there's such a duality in kids is that like they've been happening for millennia. So they're the most mundane thing out there. They're like this yeah. is, just natural this is this happens but they're also the most incredible thing as well like and i think they're much more incredible when they're yours as well like everyone thinks oh, yes, their their child's incredible and they're everyone awesome. else is like oh yeah 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 they're, they're good they're good um yeah but i think it's like just watching something in, in a especially like 
Connor, because he was born so early, and I don't know if I've even told people on the podcast that he was born at yeah, he was yeah. born at twenty six and a half weeks gestation. Yeah. So we had almost a hundred days in hospital with him. So he weighed about a kg when he was born. Um, typical baby, I think, is somewhere between three and four or three and five, depending. Um, so he was he was a pretty little guy, and then just kind of just thinking something from that's that size that small like he couldn't even breathe on his own when when he was born like he needed um breathing support and things to go from that and kind of transit through what he's what he's how he's been developing uh is just incredible way like you see the new connections that are happening in his brain. You see the new ability to process emotions and process things as well. And just kind of watching that happen in real time is completely mind blowing. Eh? Like it, I think it just makes you remember what it is. Yeah. What it is like to, to have a sense of wonder. Like I was, I was just watching him the other day as, um, we've got a, we've, we've got a dog as well. She's a greyhound, um, oh, yeah. massive chase reflex. So we can only let her off leash in, in fenced areas where there are no cats. Yeah. Um, <laughs> same, with, and, same with you and I, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Unless we want dead cats around. Um, <laughs> I think actually last time we talked about skinning cats on, on the did. podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That reminded me. <laughs> yeah. So Just get a dog, a fast <laughs> dog. But, um, like she was, she was running around. She was kind of, it's the dog park we go to is next to a road. She was chasing cars up and down the fence line. And Connor was just, he was off as well. He was kind of running back and forth, like nowhere near as fast as the cars, like the dog yeah. was, but <laughs> um, just watching him be able to run when a couple of months ago, he only just started wow. walking wow. is uh, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible kind of when you start to, to look at that. And, and I think also it, you start to ask yourself like, Oh, what's what's possible as yeah. well as like you see this such rapid development um and i think as adults like we, we we don't develop we can't develop as fast as as a child and we can't learn and pick up things as quickly but all the science shows us that we can yeah build build new new skills build new habits and you kind of think actually why why don't I give that a go? Like, yeah. why don't I try that? And, and I think like thinking about like, how do I want to, how do I want to show up as a dad and how do I want to be as a father? Um, I think I probably come up with two concepts that are, that are key for me at the moment is the, the first is, um, something that I can't remember where I read it or, or where I heard it, but it's just the line, my father showed me how to live. Mm. And, and I think that's really, that's really important in terms of like, I can't just tell him mm. what he should be doing. I need to, I need to show him. And he's such a sponge at the moment as well. Like everything you do, he copies. So you've yeah. got to watch the swear words around him. Oh Sorry. God! What's the? Can you hear that? Yeah, is that the? It's the dog. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just. What are you doing? Are you alright? Hunting on the couch. <laughs> you going alright there? Just choking on a biscuit. Hang on uh, a second. Yeah, go for it, mate. <laughs> Fox. Jesus. Sounds like he's. Uh, is he alright? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, she's she's okay. Sometimes okay. she eats biscuits real fast and just kind of I think she inhales them. Yeah. And they get kind of stuck in her lungs. <laughs> so she needs to just hock them back up and swallow them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, I've got I've got a dog that's going crazy at the moment too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got a yeah. Um are you are you um what are you working on at the moment? Have you got any projects coming up? Yeah, so I mean I've been working on um 
been been working on a little bit of this stuff in regards to um, trying to bring people back out of overwhelm, more from a team perspective, and how do we operate as as leaders to help our teams through tough times and kind of modulate the load that we're putting them under um, and start to understand also kind of the con- the contextual loads as well from outside of like a, that team environment, like what is life putting on people? Mm. Um, so doing, doing some workshops, doing a little bit of coaching with teams around that, um, which has been, has been a lot of fun. Um, and it's, it's all been virtual. At some yeah. point, it might go. It it might go to kind of in person stuff, which will be cool. But actually, like the virtual environment doing that is is quite cool as well. Um, what else am I been working on? That that's probably the that's probably the big thing. Um, mm. Trying to get trying to get the team that I run through this lockdown period safe and sound, and kind of keep us keep us going and keep us productive from a business perspective as well, which has been a has been a fascinating challenge and like it's been, it's been really good that I started thinking about doing a lot of thinking about this overwhelm stuff beforehand. Yeah, so I've been yeah, able to massively applied it to, to the work that I do there. Yeah. Um, and probably the, probably the other big project is that um, we've got number two due and oh, really? uh, yeah, in a, in a few months time. So Actually, yeah. I didn't know that. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty cool as well. So that'll be, um, yeah, that's that's another big project. Oh my god, that yeah. that is incredible! And do you know the sex? Yeah, yeah, we're having having another boy, little Tommy. Little yeah, Tommy. Yeah, yeah, my Tommy actually. Yeah, we're 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 throwing around names at the moment. Yeah, well, man, yeah. look, if, uh, if you name him after this big uh, penis head, then I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll give him a rap on the socials. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, give him a shout out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about what about you, bro? What, uh... mate? Um, got uh, you know where. My mother half's a meditation uh, teacher, so it's been really fun just to kind of, you know, work with her and, you know, mm. I, I have a couple of little programs that I offer clients and things aside from just, you know, normal normal counselling. So we throw in a bit of breath work there and, you know, that's really good for, for um, trauma release, which is really cool. But, mate, there's two big things that I really am focusing on right now. It's the, it's the podcast and it's the books. I want to get um, the Yes, I'm Fine series. Um, love to have them all out published audiobooks by the end of the year. There's a, it's a lot of it's a it's a big goal because um, I've um, I've got to get this draft done. I want to go back and write a second edition preface for my first book and just fix that up a little bit. I'm thirty five thousand words into book number three. So I need to complete the full manuscript of that one before I go back and edit it um, and then actually have to m- move through the publishing process and work with the editor and, and all that sort of stuff. So uh, the editor being my dad, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, is he, is he editing these ones too? He is editing these ones. Yes, yes. So um, so that's, what you, that's really lucky. But, yeah, but I'd love to, love to have all those out Um by the end of the year so that's just my main focus i suppose yeah awesome bro awesome that is that is very cool we probably uh pr- probably should let you go and have some dinner mate and i should right. probably go and tuck myself in for, for some beauty sleep but it's yeah, always tuck yourself in you probably, it's get, all... you probably get two hours a night at the moment wouldn't you <laughs> oh no, no he's he's not too bad he's not oh, too good. bad um he every uh, a couple of times a week he wakes up at about five which is a little, it's a little bit niggly, um, yeah. but the rest of the time you'll sleep through till about six. So, mate, if you want to, if you want to train yourself to get up early, have a baby. <laughs> I'll do it. You know, yeah. I'll do it now. Yeah. I'll have good. one tomorrow. All right. Good. Good. <laughs> Very yeah. sort of, yeah, Danny DeVito, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> That's right. It's a skill. The mm. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can just get those neural connections going. <laughs> <laughs> the tools that you use. <laughs> exactly. Oh, buddy, it's it's been awesome. Um, it's let's make fun. sure it's uh, it's shorter turnaround time than <laughs> than fourteen months next time, mate. I would like to. I think we could probably do round four um, at least by September, October. You know, you, you'd you'd have uh, child number two, little Tommy, and yeah. uh, I'd, I'd I'd hopefully have the books out by then, so we could rendezvous. Yeah, nice. That sounds that sounds good, mate. That sounds good. Let's uh, let's pencil it in. Done. Done.
<laughs> awesome, bro. You have a you have a good one. <laughs>